So uh, this last section is going to be a little bit different than some of the things that you guys have usually seen in Grand Rounds. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit of some operational procedures, things that might help you be more efficient, more effective, uh, and then just some mindsets for being able to uh, move forward with the, the company as it's growing, move forward with Cox EMS as it continues to build the uh, foundation of where it's going. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, back in November of 2018, uh, I had the opportunity to go do a leadership for first responders course put on in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I was put on by a company uh, called Echelon Front. Echelon Front is run by, uh, a, man by the, a, a man by the name of Jocko Willink. If you aren't familiar with him, uh, he was a lieutenant commander in the Navy SEALs, uh, led a very successful um, seas cold clear raid mission in Al Ramadi during the reign of Saddam Hussein. Um, in this leadership for first responders course, he gave a lot of tips, tricks, and tools to be able to be more effective uh, in the environment in which we work. So uh, for those of you who have been through the academy recently, you may have seen this material, you may be seeing this material currently, uh, but a second reminder is always a good thing. So. Um, as new hires come in, this is, this is one of the courses that they come through in the first week. Uh, one of the concepts as we kind of rebuilt the curriculum for the academy was we wanted to create uh, something that's valuable for the people that are coming through it uh, in, in many different facets of their life, personally, professionally, uh, with relationships, professional relationship, personal relationships. And that's what this is. So uh, I want to start this, and you guys don't have to answer. You can just think to yourselves. I want you to think about why you're here right now. You guys just sat through seven, eight, almost eight hours worth of uh, continuing education hours, reviewing uh, the core things that you need to be able to do to be able to support life in a pre-hospital environment, right? What can we do to make things better for our patients? What can we do to improve operational capacity and efficiency? And so uh, this quote by Frederick Nietzsche, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. I want you to think about that. Think about what he means. <clears throat> Does anybody want to venture a guess as to what he means? If you have a reason to live, then you're going to do it no matter how, you, how it happens. Yeah, if you have a purpose, if you have a reason, if you have something motivating you, almost any obstacle, obstacle can be uh, overcome. Ryan Holiday wrote a really good book called The Obstacle is the Way. Uh, and in that book, he talks about how most people, when they see an obstacle in front of them, they see it as the thing keeping them from being successful, when in actual, in reality, it's, it's the obstacle that teaches them the lessons, the, the, gives them the knowledge and the skill set to be able to get to the su success that they're trying to achieve. Um, so as we go through this, and as you guys continue to come to Grand Rounds and continue to build your skill set, I want you to remember about why you get involved, why you're involved here at Cox EMS, and why you're involved as a pre-hospital provider. <clears throat> so... As many of you know, I'm a recently promoted field supervisor, and one of the things that I do quite often is field phone calls. Most of you know that. Um, and oftentimes, I get phone calls that, as the phone call ends, I wonder to myself, why, why did they feel like they needed to call me for that? Because most of the time, it's stuff that you guys can solve on your own. Um, and so I pose this story to you, and it's kind of hard to see um, because of the light. Uh, but let's say I put you in a room, okay? You're in a square room, there's nothing in the room, and, and you're standing in a corner. And I tell you, I want you to walk from that corner of the room to that corner of the room in a straight line, okay? And halfway through walking through this room, I throw a chair in your way. What are you gonna do? Move the chair. chair. What do you say? Go around the chair. Sit down in the chair, huh? <laughs> uh, okay, so. Similar situation, slightly different though. Let's say I put you in a room and I don't give you any direction. I just put you in the room and I say, bye. What are you gonna do, huh? <laughs> For some of us, it might need to be. <clears throat> um, it's not as clear, right? There are, our answers are kind of scattered and inconsistent, right? Because 
without a clear understanding of where you are going, your natural problem solving, your innate innovation, your ability to adapt, all those different things don't occur. You have to have that clear understanding of where it is you're going. What is that, that light at the end of the tunnel, that um, goal that you are trying to achieve? Um, so why do I tell this story? Because we have to have clarity of why in what we're doing, okay? When you guys get out into the field and you are challenged with an obstacle that you don't know how to overcome, you're going to have to make some decisions. Now, we've all faced those decisions in various different areas. Um, if I was to pose a, a pre-hospital scenario to you, you would say something like, you know, I would support ventilations, I would stop massive hemorrhage, I would, I would uh, transport the ill and injured to the hospital, right? But let's say I give you an example of you work for a uh, Fortune 500 factory, um, you are a mid-level management for, uh, staff, and you have a certain number of, of units that you need to be putting out per hour, and you're not meeting that unit number, uh, what are you going to do to solve that problem? Root cause analysis, maybe, right? <clears throat> what procedures are you going to implement to correct it? Depends on what the problem is, right? Do you have a clear understanding of how you're going to fix that problem? Like, let's say you build biopharmaceutical tank systems and you're not producing enough tank systems, what are you going to do to correct it? Okay. You inevitably, you have to do that root cause analysis, but depending on the field that you work in, some things may not be as immediately clear, or as immediately evident as they are in pre-hospital environment for us, because that's our wheelhouse, right? <clears throat> At some point during your career here, the Cox mission, vision, and values was placed in front of you. Why do you think that is? because the Cox mission, vision, and values are your guiding light. They are the direction, they are the goal that we are trying to achieve. When we talk about the vision statement, everybody's heard that, right? To be the best for those who need us. When you're sitting on the side of the road with a patient and you need some kind of decision, you need some kind of, of authority figure to say, yes, you can do that, but I'm predisposed, I'm on a call, I'm not answering my phone, uh, well, whoever your manager is isn't available to answer the phone. How do you make that decision? Consider the mission, vision, and values. Consider the direction of which you are going. Ask yourself, is this decision the best for the patient? Right? Is this the best decision I can make for the patient that needs me at this time? Along with that, we have to have discipline of how we're going to do that. Um, when we talk about how, that's, those are the things that, those are the processes and the procedures and, and the steps. So the, the loading of a patient, the starting of an IV, the giving of meds, various different things. We have to have discipline in that. We have to understand what our skill set is, what that capacity is, and how to do that effectively, how to do that appropriately, and how to do that with a high quality of care. And then we also have to have continuity of what, what we are delivering. When we talk about the values, values of, of Cox are safety, compassion, respect, and integrity. Every decision you make is based in the continuity of what? What are you doing? Are you being safe? What are you doing? Are you being compassionate? What are you doing? Are you being respectful? Every decision you make can be filtered through these things, and if it aligns with it, it's an appropriate decision. If it does not align with it, then it is not an appropriate decision, <clears throat> right? For example, if you have a patient on a cot and you're sitting on the side of the highway, is it appropriate to push them down the road? Nope. No, right? Because that's not safe, it's not compassionate, it's not respectful, right? There's also things that we can do on a more granular level. We can filter that on a granular level. When we're talking with our patients, the way that we speak, the way that we interact with each other, the way that we, uh, the way that we hold ourselves when we're with our patients, are we being safe with our patients? Are we being compassionate with our patients? Um, and are we being respectful? <clears throat> so uh, when it comes to integrity, you have to, you have to walk the walk that you talk. For example, as I stand here in front of you, every single one of you, and I challenge you to become a provider that can meet these standards, and many of you do, you, 
you will see me mirroring these to the best of my ability. Now, I am human. I will make mistakes. But every day I come to work, I ask myself, am I making decisions that align with the mission, vision, and values? Am I making decisions that you would be proud of? Because I wear the same patch that you do. And you wear the same patch that I do. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of people like to give me a hard time because I harp on uniform policy, right? You guys have heard me. Hey, tuck in your shirt, polish your boots, whatever. Why do you think I care about that? Huh? Because it's policy? How about this? How about this? Take a moment. How about the fact that there is going to be a moment in your career where you show up on scene and a woman is going to walk out of her house holding her universe. Everything that matters to her. Everything in the world that could, could ever matter to her. And she hands you her universe simply because you look like you belong. She doesn't ask for your certification. She doesn't ask for your licensure. She trusts you because you look like you can do the job and you look like you're the person who's supposed to do it. And I take that very seriously, right? Any one of us in this room could respond to any one of the other person's family member, friend, coworker. The things that we're talking about, talking about right now are, are very serious, right? And it's very important that as we work throughout our daily lives, as we work throughout the monotony of the calls that we run and the the care that we provide to always be compassionate with everybody and hold that level of integrity. Now, in relation specifically to COX EMS, we have a little bit of a worry mission statement. I'll read it to you here. <clears throat> COX Health EMS will be the industry leader in emergency medical care, education and research, focusing on the professional and personal development of staff, clinical applications and approaches that are driven by best practice, and a dedication to fiscal responsibility and accountability. So why do I put that in front of you? We just spent maybe 15, 20 minutes going over billing, right? And billing irritates everybody, right? Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to take these steps? Can't somebody else do this? <coughs> Except what about when you're the patient and you're getting the bill? Do you not wish that somebody would have taken 30 seconds to fill out that appropriately so that you got billed correctly, so that your bill went to the insurance company and not to you, so you're not finding out six months after your bill's already gone into collections that you even had a bill? These are little steps in your workflow that you can implement and they will profoundly impact long-term care. As we stand here in front of you and teach you all these different things and we, we teach each other how to become better providers and, and implement better processes, the idea is to improve discharge from hospital, right? Because that's what ultimately matters. You know, oftentimes I hear providers say, well, I got them to the hospital alive, so I did my job. Who here believes that? That, that your whole job is to just get your patient to the hospital alive. Nobody, because that is only a piece of your job. Because we can profoundly impact the quality of life at discharge from hospital off the granular decisions that we make during patient care. You guys probably also saw the, uh, at some point in your career, have seen or heard of the partner's behaviors. <clears throat> Most people, when they see this, they think it's corporate mumbo jumbo, right? It's all, oh, that's feel good stuff. They just wanna make sure they know that we care, right? Or, or we know that they care. <clears throat> Except these, these things right here, these character traits, those moral compass values, those are the things that you make your decisions based off of, the way that you hold yourself, the way that you interact with your coworkers. <clears throat> we all in this room can agree that there's a significant difference between the operational capacity of the Mercy ER and the operational capacity of the Cox South ER. Yes, okay, right, okay. <clears throat> That being said, what do you think is the biggest factor in that? Right. Mercy has a very independent nursing environment. A nurse is assigned rooms. They're her responsibility, and she will deal with them when she can. Right? Except what happens when you go into an ER room at Cox South? You got people waiting on you. 
Are the people waiting on you the people who are assigned that room? Not necessarily. In fact, I would argue 50 to 60% of the time it's not. Okay? It's other coworkers looking out for their team. Because ultimately, if we look out for each other, we start to see a better outcome, better patient care. We start to reduce unit hour utilization on individuals. Your stress load decreases. When your stress load decreases, you're happier. When you're happier, you do better at your job. When you do better at your job, you take better care of your patients. It's never ending, okay? <clears throat> so down, when I went down to this uh, leadership course, he talks a lot about concepts that he talks about in this book, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend it. It's an excellent book. It's called Extreme Ownership. The concept of extreme ownership means that you take ownership of everything that you can operationally affect. So what does that mean? Let's say you come into work and, you know, we're supposed to get 10 minutes to check our trucks, right? So we come into work. Let's say you start at 7 a.m. It's 7.02. You literally just sat down and tore open your red bag and dispatch is hollering at you, hey, uh, you know, 706, I need you to respond to a call. Are you available? Well, we do what all good coworkers would do. Yes, we're available. Let's run this call. So you jump in, you run lights and siren, you find out it's a cardiac arrest. You fly up on scene safely, right? Not wrecking an ambulance. Show up on scene and you jump out of your vehicle, you grab your red bag, and all of a sudden you notice you don't have a monitor. What are you going to do? Call the soup, see if you can bring one. See if there's another unit close by. Ask yourself where you are. Maybe there's an AED on a wall somewhere, right? In that moment, does it matter whose fault it was that there was no monitor on the truck? No. Because does fault really matter? Does fault have any outcome, any, any weight on the outcome of the situation? I would argue that it has nothing to do with discipline. Fault never matters, right? If I'm born into a, a poor home and I don't have money to go to college, it's not my fault, right? You make a way. You yeah, you've got to make a decision. You've got to decide that, that no matter what environment I've been put in, I can affect the outcome based off my decisions. But I have to take ownership of that. Because I could say, well, you know, my mom and dad were poor at my, m managing money, and because they couldn't manage money, I'll never go to college. And then I could never go to college, right? Or I can say, hey, you know what? My mom and dad were bad at managing money, and that means i got to work harder. Right? Fault doesn't matter. Fault does not affect the outcome of the situation, whether yours or another's. It is simply a definition of fact. It is a piece of information. You can use it how you wish, but it is only a piece of information. Taking responsibility is not an admission of guilt. It is simply an acknowledgement of your role in that situation and the fact that you possess the power to impact the mission, whatever it is that you are trying to achieve. Now, what extreme ownership is not is it is not convenient. You can't come into work and say, you need to take extreme ownership and run that call because you, you chose to be here, so let's step it up. That's not how it works, right? Extreme ownership is taking ownership of what you can impact. So when I come to work, I say, what can I do to affect the mission? What can I do to make this better? What can I do to improve my operational capacity, to improve my team's ability to be successful, to improve my team's ability to provide high-quality patient care? <clears throat> if you're frustrated with the way things are, be part of the solution, not part of the problem, right? We can oftentimes say, well, this needs to be fixed. Does that help the situation? Not really. What if we say this needs to be fixed and here is a way we can fix it? Here is an implementation plan. This is why I think this will be successful. Lead from the down up, or from down up. Lead up the chain of command, right? So as the, as the course went on, he began to talk about what he calls the four laws of combat. Now, I've changed the wording a little bit to be a little more politically correct for the civilian environment. However, when we talk about the environments in which we operate and the environment in which a, a soldier operates, they're not too horribly different, right? Now, we don't see the same level of life threat. I, I easily agree to that. But, but we do see life threats, do we not? Yeah? 
And so we also see uh, an ever-changing environment in relation to the dynamic of the scene, what resources are available, where we are, our physical location, what capacity that we operate, how many providers we have. You know, we may start on a scene with one patient and end up with two. That's happened to me a couple of times. You show up on a scene, you have one patient, another one has a seizure, now you got two patients. Probably don't have enough resources to manage it, right? And so he talks about what he calls these four laws of, of combat. And the very first law, the, the thing that comes before anything else, does anybody want to guess what it is? Somebody who hasn't been through the academy yet? <clears throat> what was the very first thing that they taught you in EMT classes, the most important at all times? BSI. Before BSI. Safety, right? Your safety and your partner's safety. So the first law of combat is cover and move. It's teamwork. The thing that comes before everything else is teamwork. Every decision you make, every operational choice, every everything that you do affects the, the mission of the, of the team, right? If you are sitting at Cox South and you're watching another crew get a phone call or get an get a emergency call and you're available, are you not impacting the team? Are you not? What if that call happens to be closer to you than somebody else? Because that never happens, right? Right? I chose this picture for a very specific reason. Why do you think that is? They all work in sync. They have to work together. They have to be going in the same direction. And they have to be in sync. If I take this second person back here and I tell him to start rowing in the opposite direction, what happens to the system? It falls apart. It falls apart. So they go from an Olympic award-winning boat team to I could probably, as fat as I am, pass them in a paddle boat. <laughs> Right? <clears throat> I want to see that too. <clears throat> um, so, you have to support your team. If you let somebody fail, you're letting the team fail. I don't know how many times I've gotten a phone call that goes something like, hey, this person has no clue what they're doing. You need to look into this. Right? Except you were there. Not you specifically, I'm speaking metaphorically. Right? We all know that person who struggles clinically, that person who, who maybe needs a little bit of help, right? We all have students on our truck, right? We're at capacity for students. I've heard that several times. Hey, this ENT student, they don't have a clue what they're doing. Help them, right? Because those students are gonna become your partners. And anybody who wants to challenge that, I rode as a Battlefield EMT clinical ride time student. And now I stand in front of you, a field supervisor for Green County. The students that are on your truck will become your partners and will have great impact on your career. If you have partners that are struggling, ask yourself, did they have preceptors? Did they have FTOs? Did they have supervisors and managers that invested into them to make them strong providers? And did we not have an opportunity at some point during the day to affect or impact them and their ability to provide care? Most likely. So don't let somebody fail. Support your team. If you're 20 minutes on a PRC and you're about to get in the truck because you've already got your paperwork gathered, you've already got the information gathered, you're just working on finalizing it, and a cardiac arrest comes in two and a half blocks away from you, what do you want to do? How do you support the team? Take the cardiac arrest. Does it mean more work for you? Yeah. Okay. But ultimately, the, the idea is we take it for you, you take it for me. I am very proud to say that I hear that more often than I have in the last probably four or five years that I've worked here. Crews jumping on the radio going, hey, I'll take that call for you so you don't get off late. Hey, I'll take that call so that you can get a break, so you can eat some food, so you can go back and grab the food that you ordered but never got, that you paid for but never got, right? I encourage that behavior because that, the more we do that for each other, the better the workload gets for everybody, right? 
So support your team. The second law of combat, or law of dynamic environments, is simple. That's it. Simple. Why? What was that? If it's too complicated to understand, it's too complicated to execute, right? If I tell you I'm working on a big MCI scene, and I tell you, all right, when you get here, you got to find the red truck. Now, when you get to the red truck, you got to go 100 paces north. When you get 100 paces north, you need to hop on your left foot three times. you got to hold your tongue to the right. Now, when you do that, you need to look due east. Now, when you look due east, you'll see a squirrel. When you see the squirrel, he should run. You see what I'm getting at here, right? If it gets too complicated to execute, it's, it, you won't understand and it won't, you won't be successful. Versus if I say, when you approach the scene, you'll see a red car. When you get there, head due east, you'll find me. You'll overcome the obstacles because you know where your goal is, right? Just like this, the chair story, the different trucks, the different patients, the different things that you're challenged with, you'll adapt and overcome, right? You'll problem solve. You also see this in communication. How many have ever jumped on the radio to, you know, you're 30 seconds out from a hospital with a cardiac arrest and you've got another uh, provider on the HEAR channel, which I realize the HEAR channel is not being used as much anymore. But you've got another provider on the HEAR channel who's given a full patient story. That ever happened? <laughs> a lot, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, happens a lot. Maybe if we take a minute and consider what the other person on the other side needs to, needs to know, if we can simplify that, if we can make it clear and concise, we can effectively get that information across, we can get off the radio as fast as we get on it, right? And that's going to free you up as a provider to let that hospital know, hey, I've got a cardiac arrest, and that will give them 30 more seconds to be able to provide a physician, a respiratory therapist, radiology, all the things that may need to be in the room for whatever patient you have, right? Another thing that he talks about is prioritize and execute. Now, I will tell you, one of the things that I learned very quickly as I got off of my FTO time and as a brand new paramedic, one of the things I learned very quickly is that paramedic school and EMT school did not prepare me to operate in a real world environment. Now, it's not that they didn't give me the appropriate knowledge. They gave me the right knowledge. They gave me the foundation that I needed to have. But what they did not give me is an understanding of how to make operational decisions. For example, what does paramedic school teach you to look for for attention pneumo? JVD, tracheal deviation, deviation. Absent. absent or diminished lung sounds, right? Except how many providers in this room have ever seen tracheal deviation with JVD? But I would argue a handful of you have needle decompressed some patients, right? But paramedic school said tracheal deviation and JVD. So how did you make that decision? Yeah, except you're basing that off of years of experience. I'm a brand new paramedic. I don't have that. I don't know what common sense is yet, right? All I know is that I have a 10 gauge, three inch needle that I need to stab in this guy's chest and paramedic school said tracheal deviation and JVD. The point I'm getting at is I had to learn to make operational decisions based off of common sense, based off of a group of information, a gathering of lots of clinical signs that add up to that clinical treatment, right? My first call, and the reason that I use this, my first call off to FTO was, it was the first one on my own, I'm thinking I'm a rock star, right, fresh out of paramedic school, and it's my own truck, and I'm excited, right? I'm finally wearing that paramedic patch. And my first call is a 35-year-old, 32-week pregnant, actively seizing woman, right? And I walk up, and she's full tonic-clonic, right? <laughs> that paramedic school knowledge fresh in my head, right? I'm thinking, all right, she's eclamptic. She's hypertensive. She needs mag. These are my doses of mag. And as I'm running through that in my head, a bystander comes up and says, she's epileptic. And I was like, well, oh. Wait, so if she's epileptic, then, then she needs benzos. Okay, so, so if she needs benzos, then wait, do I give her the adult dose or do I give her the pediatric dose? If I give her the adult dose, am I going to kill the baby? 
If I give it the pediatric dose, am I going to stop the seizure? Now, I was a brand new paramedic, just like any one of you may have been or may be in this room, right? And if you're the pregnant woman seizing in the room, you want me to make a decision, right? <laughs> now, ultimately, what I did was I gave the low dose of an adult do dose benzo, and I managed the situation. Things were fine. She gave her baby full term. There were no complications. However, it was immediately evident to me that I could not wait for 10 years of paramedic experience. I needed to change my system. I needed to change the way that I was approaching my patient care. And how did I do this? So uh, with OTC, you have to do that one shift with Dr. Brandt, right? And so <laughs> I remember I was super intimidated. Dr. Brandt, I came in and he sat me down. And he said, You're not, we're not going to talk until we see our first patient. When we go in to see the first patient, he goes, I want you to pay attention to what I do. And then we'll talk after. And I said, OK. And I remember this to the day. We got up. We walked into the room. He takes his right hand and reaches down and grabs the patient's right pop or, uh, dorsalis pedis pulse and says, what brought you into the emergency department today? Why is that significant? What was that? He's getting a lot of information really fast. How many of you are familiar with uh, how to maintain situational awareness? Most of you should be, right? You have to establish a baseline, right? If you're standing in a concert hall for a symphony and there's one person standing there screaming, they're going to stand out, right? So they're the outlier. If you're standing in a Slipknot concert, the person standing there screaming is probably not an outlier, right? It's the person sitting down, the person doing something different. The thing that he created by routinely, every single patient that he came into contact with, he would reach down, grab the, the dorsalis pedis pulse, and he would ask the same question. Because after 300 patients touching their dorsalis pedis pulse and having them, the 301st patient that he touches and doesn't have a pulse, he's going to notice, right? How many of you were confident the first time you ever listened to lung sounds? I'm pretty sure I didn't even hear anything the first time I listened to lung sounds, okay? So what happens when that first patient that you take care of, the first one you ever choose to listen to lung sounds on, has a tension pneumo. Are you going to know? Are you going to have enough information to stab a 10 gauge 3 inch needle in their chest? No. But what if you listen to 300 normal patients lung sounds and 301 has a tension pneumo? Are you going to notice? You would at least notice that something was off, right? You could be more confident in that decision. So I realized I had to start applying this concept of I need to be intentional about the baseline that I'm creating. So implementing little decisions, like every single patient that I take care of, I listen to lung sounds on. Whether you're a respiratory patient or a cardiac patient or a toe pain patient, I listen to your lung sounds. Because what I build is a habitual nacer to listen to lung sounds. And then when shit hits the fan, and it will, and your critical thinking goes out the window, it will. It's proven, it's a biological fact, right? Your muscle memory, your habits will kick in, right? We've all heard that saying, we don't rise to the level of our expectation, we fall to the level of our training, right? Every single one of us does. And when the chaos ensues, when we fall to that level, it's the level that we routinely train at, right? And if there is one piece of information that I want you to leave with here today, it's this one piece of information. It is something that I wish that somebody would have told me at the beginning of EMT school. It's something that I wish that somebody would have told me in paramedic school. And it's something that I implement every single day I come to work, okay? Every stable patient is practice for your unstable patient. The way that you approach stable patients will directly impact how you handle unstable patients. If you're lackadaisical about your approach with stable patients, you will not be able to perform to the standard at which you want yourself to perform with a critical patient. That's how it is. One of the things that we face in those very intense, high-stress situations, as we're, you know, we're rounding up, it's a cardiac arrest, it's a trauma code, whatever your call is, we feel that dump of epinephrine and cortisol, our fight-or-flight response kicks in, right? the critical thinking goes out the window, and we get stuck in this paralysis by analysis. 
some point in your career, you've been standing there over a patient going, well, I've got this, but if I've got this and I need to do this, and if I'm going to do this, well, before I do that, I need to make sure that this is true, right? And you get stuck in this loop. We see it a lot in people who are boarding. Um, you walk in, you're super stressed out about passing boarding and being licensed to be a field provider, getting your job, securing your job here. <clears throat> and so you walk in and you're sitting there working the Michael Swan VFib code, something you've worked 900 times, right? And you're not, you can't figure out why in, the re, why in the world you're not getting ROSC. And you just keep wondering, why am I not going anywhere? Why am I not going anywhere? You got to break this paralysis by analysis. How do you do that? Take a breath, right? First thing we gotta do is take a breath. We gotta gather our thoughts, take a deep breath, start back at zero. Okay, first thing I did was I walked in the room. Second thing I did was I saw my patient. Third thing I did, were they responsive? I had an apneic unresponsive patient, I started CPR. Once I started CPR, I applied the pads. The pads said, no shock advised. Okay, next thing I did was, oh, hey, look, I haven't started breathing my patient. Let's start, let's drop an eye gel, let's put in an ET tube, let's get a BVM and start bagging our patient. And then you kick back up, kick back off, right? So <clears throat> you have to break that paralysis by analysis loop. And then you can implement, and this is the procedure that I came up with. Now, the cool thing about this, well, I didn't come up with it. It's the procedure I found. Um, the cool thing about this is it's flexible. I'm not telling you how or what order to do what you need to do. I'm just giving you a system in which you can gather information and make decisions, right? So, we're just going to move past this slide. So, the system I found is called, it's got a stupid name, it's called the OODA loop, okay? It's called the OODA loop because it's an acronym, O-O-D-A, Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. It's a way to maintain situational awareness. Situational awareness. John Boyd was the, uh, the individual who came up with it. He's a fighter pilot and he was trying to come up with a way to stay situational aware, situationally aware uh, in fast, ever-changing environments. So the first O, observe. This is where you gather your information. All types of information are coming in, right? Your GCS, your provider impression, your various different vital signs, your sample history, your OPQRSD, where you are, cultural information, everything that you can gather on a scene, right? Now, not all that information's pertinent, right? There's some stuff that you don't care about. You don't care that they had surgery 10 years ago on their left pinky, right? So the next thing we have to do is we have to apply ourselves as filters. We have to decide what are pertinent positives, what are pertinent negatives, what is the information that we're going to use. When we apply this filter, this is where we implement things like the differential diagnosis procedure, where we look at the probability and severity, the various different differentials that we think our pa patients have. This is also where we take our medical knowledge, our medical experience, and we look at that information to say, this is what I think is going on with a patient. And then from that, we begin to make decisions for the patients, or make decisions on treatments for the patient. Now, <clears throat> you know, in this section too, in the Orient section, where you, where you start to look at with using your medical experience and medical uh, knowledge to give you some direction, you may also find things like uh, cultural things, right? So if you're working out in Seymour, and you're working with an Amish patient, or, and they're a trauma patient, are you automatically gonna put them on a helicopter? Maybe not, right? Because they may not wanna be put on a helicopter. If you have a Jehovah's Witness in the back of your ambulance, are you gonna give them blood, if we could? No, because their cultural beliefs, their decisions, affect your workflow, what, the, what you may or may not do. Now, when we make that decision, that we're gonna do something. We're gonna synchronize cardiovert, we're gonna defib, we're gonna needle decompress, we're gonna start an IV, we're gonna give you solumedrol, whatever it is. In this section, we have to make that decision to treat and then we have to do that risk mitigation, right? We always look at the pros and cons, right? If I have a patient who has a tension pneumo, what is the con of not needle decompressing my patient? Death. Is it then justified to do the procedure? Yes, because the con outweighs the risk of doing the procedure. Right? You tracking? I've got some deer in the headlights. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and then the last step, and this is what most providers tell them, patients or students in the back of the ambulance is, you just got to do it. Right? You're posed with a situation, you just got to do it. That's true. 
Now, <clears throat> if you can implement a procedure like this, and I'm not saying you need to gather your sample history first or get your pulse rate first. I'm just saying gather your information the way that you gather your information. Then filter that information. Be conscious. I don't know how many students I've had in the back of my ambulance. They'll be asking all these questions, and they have a huge notebook, and they write all this information down, right? They ask all the information, and then what do they do? They stop. They're like, okay, I got the information. I'll give it to the nurse when we get there. Use the information to make your treatment decision. Filter that information. What's positive? What's, what's important, right? So I'm going to change gears just a little bit here. The last law of combat is what he calls decentralized command, or the fact that you need to have leadership at all levels. You guys are all providers who are in the field, and at various different times, various different situations, you are going to be the leader on the scene, the person who makes decisions, right? And you have to make decisions that align with COX EMS, that align with your partners, that align with your peers and your coworkers, right? You don't need me to make some of those decisions, right? Right? You can make them. As long as they align with the mission, vision, and values, as long as they align with the COX EMS mission, right? To be the best for those who need us. <clears throat> One of the things that we teach in the academy pretty routinely is that the why matters. Right? So, an example of this. Let's say... Oh, here's a good one. Okay, so you have a patient who um, altered mental status. They've got hypotensive pressures. They're tachycardic, and uh, they have a mild fever. What do you think they have? What do you think they are? Somebody said it's septic, right? What was the defining factor for you to make that decision? What, what was the fever, right? Yeah, the fever, the fever says... If I have hypotension and tachycardia, an altered mental status, and a fever, I suspect sepsis, right? That little piece of information, knowing that they have a fever, directly changes how you approach patient care. That patient came from being a standard altered mental status to a potentially time-critical diagnosis, right? Because you understood what was going on, right? You understood the why. You understood why the body is acting the way that it is. You know that the patient is tachycardic and hypotensive secondary to all the inflammatory processes called by, caused by a systemic infection, right? The why matters, right? The decisions that you make in the field, why you make them matters. If you make a decision based strictly off yourself, is it going to impact everybody in this room? Very much so, right? For example, okay, you're scheduled on a truck and... You decide, okay, well, I just don't feel like being here anymore. And you go home. Fair enough. But does that impact your team? Yeah, the same number of calls are coming in, guys. We just have one less truck to do it with. Right? So when you make those decisions, why you make those decisions matter. Now, if you're making that decision because you're sick, then it's an appropriate decision. It's appropriate. The why matters, right? So just be conscious of... of why you're making the decisions that you're making. Now, it's easy to say this. It's much harder to implement it. We've all probably seen this picture somewhere, right? Pretty, yeah, pretty viral. See it on Facebook, various different things. Who wants the boss on the top? Nobody. Who wants the boss on the bottom? Nobody. Who wants the boss on the bottom? Huh? Two people? You would think, right? Absolutely. Except, do you think it's easy to be this person? Yeah. I have to stand in front of you right now and put this information in front of you and take some heat. Right? You think that's easy? I'm a new provider. I haven't had my license for as long as much of you, many of you in this room. Right? 
but why am I in front of you right now? Why am I putting this information in front of you? Because I want to make a difference in your life. Because I want to make a difference in your capacity. I want to make a difference in your ability to Im improve patient outcome. Right? The why matters. And I challenge you to look at the people who may be in this position. I challenge you to be that person. Right? When we're all out there in the field, it doesn't take a lot to be able to do something like, hey, I'll run that call. Hey, I'll, you know, or I don't know. There's various different reasons, different ways that you can do it. Um, supporting your peers, coming in, shift trades, all kinds of different things. But it takes courage to be that person, the person up front. Uh, another skill set that I highly recommend, and this is something that we teach a lot in the academy, is this concept of default aggressive. Now, when you hear the word aggressive, what I don't want you to think about is the guy puffing up his chest in the front of the room who's like, oh, I'm the biggest Billy Bob badass and I'm going to kick butt and take name. No, I don't mean that. What I mean is be the person who steps up and leads, the person who takes the dive, the person who takes the challenge, who, who attempts, right? I remember back when we first got the auto pulses, the Zoll guy came down and he gave a lecture on how to use the, uh, the auto pulses, right? He gave an in-service training. And he gave his like hour-long in-service training and then uh, he did what any good instructor would do at the end of the training and he was like, all right, I need some volunteers. I was an EMT at the time and Roger Bennett was my partner. And Roger said, Owen, let's go, we're gonna do it. And I got voluntold. And boy, you'd have thought we weren't even present during that lecture because we didn't have a clue what we were doing. We looked like a bunch of babbling buffoons in front of everybody, right? Except, what happens when I use an autopulse now? I know how to do it. Failure teaches you a lot, right? Failure is a great teacher. Failure is part of the process, okay? We have to be willing to jump in and take those risks and attempt to fail before we'll have the opportunity to learn. I'm going to skip ahead here just for a second. <clears> the <throat> quote by Theodore Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotion, devotions, who spends himself on a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither nor know victory nor defeat. What does he mean? Yeah, you got to try, and the credit goes to the person who's actually trying. How many of you have ever seen or heard an armchair quarterback trying to make all the calls and say, well, it should have been done this way, right? How many of you have ever had a call, and you later hear somebody say, well, if I was on that call, I would have run it this way? Except they weren't there, right? They weren't challenged the way that you were challenged. They weren't, they weren't in the situation that you were in. Right? Understand that just because we fail, just because we struggle, doesn't necessarily mean anything bad is happening. It is part of the process. It is part of growing. I remember standing out in front of the lawn out here in front of OTC, and I was going through paramedic time, uh, or paramedic class, and I had an altered mental status patient, couldn't figure out why the patient wasn't changing. It was altered. The scenario wasn't changing. I was stuck in a loop. What was I not doing? Blood sugar, right? We all do it. Every single patient we take, some reason, we go into a boarding scenario, we go into grand rounds, and blood sugar just out the window, right? It happens. It's part of the process. So why do I care about that? Because... To be successful, to see great success, you have to have humility. You absolutely have to have humility. Vulnerability is an asset. 
all right? How many of you have ever had that, uh, that provider who says, well, I already got my license, I know. Do you trust that provider? Why? Because there, there's nothing left for them to learn? Who in this room feels like there's nothing left that they can learn to become a better provider? Right. So when there is somebody, that's, that sends up a red flag. Understand that, that an acknowledgement of a mistake or an inadequacy, it is not an admission of guilt or an admission of weakness. It is simply an acknowledgement of this is where I can improve. For example, if I don't know how to take a blood pressure, okay, so what? Teach me how to take a blood pressure, we'll move on, right? If there's something you struggle with, just know it, right? There's that, that cliche with the 12-step process, right? What's the first step? Admit you have a problem, right? So, along with this humility, though, you have to balance it with confidence. Uh, I'll give you an example. In, in World War II, they were sending 18-year-old guys off into the European theater to be fighter pilots, right? And if you would have walked up to one of those fighter pilots and asked them, who is the best fighter pilot in the world, what, who would they say? Themselves. Themselves. Why? They were confident, right? Because the moment that they doubted themselves, they'd die. They'd get shot out of the sky. Because that's when you hesitate. When you are in the back of an ambulance, is that the time to doubt your skill set? When you're with a patient? No. You should be confident, confident in the patch you wear, confident in the skills and abilities that you have. However, you have to balance that when you get done with the call to say, hey, what worked well, what didn't? Right? Because we have to identify what worked well, we double down on it, we make improvements, and then we have to look at our weaknesses and say, how do I make that better? How do I grow? What can I learn? Who can build my skill set or my ability? And as we grow as providers, we'll come up with new ways, new avenues, new things that we can do. As many of you know, healthcare is an ever-changing environment. We are consistently seeing changes, whether it be in how CPR is done or what medications we give in a cardiac arrest. Um, I remember one of the coolest things I ever saw was uh, we had a patient who had been maced and the paramedic I was working with loaded them up in the back and they grabbed a bag of saline and they took a nasal cannula and they hooked the bag of saline up to the nasal cannula and they draped it down and they put each nair over the patient's eyes and let it run out, right? I thought that was the coolest thing I had ever seen. I mean, it was the coolest thing since sliced bread, right? Is that what a nasal cannula was used for? But did it work? Absolutely. So again, if you're making decisions that align with things that make your patients care better, that make your capacity to affect and Im impact patients, you're going to see great improvement. A little dad joke up there, the right idea will fly. <clears throat> so, how many of you have ever seen the hierarchy of competence? This is a law that was in effect, the moment you were born, right? So the first level of the hierarchy of competence is unconscious incompetence. What does that mean? You don't know what you don't know, right? So when I was born, I didn't know how to walk, right? And I didn't know that I didn't know how to walk. I just didn't know. Then one day I saw somebody walking across the room and I went, hey, that looks like fun. But I don't know how to do that. This is a good place to be. This is conscious incompetence. We are now aware that we do not know, right? For the paramedics in the room, that was the moment you walked into paramedic class and you went, what the heck did I just get into, right? Yes, only me? Okay, fair enough. So. This is a good place to be because this is where learning happens. This is where growth happens because you're aware of an inadequacy and you begin to work to build it and to grow it and to get better at it. Now, 
as we do iteration after iteration, we move into what's called conscious competence. Conscious competence means you are aware that you are doing it right and you're doing it right. So at some point, you didn't know how to do a blood pressure, right? They walked you through the steps on how to do a blood pressure and then you would consciously walk through the steps of doing it. First, I gotta have my blood pressure cuff, then I gotta have my stethoscope. I gotta have a patient's arm. I gotta make sure it's the right, the correct arm, not the right arm, but the correct arm. Uh, where am I gonna place my stethoscope? Where am I gonna listen to the blood pressure? Various different things. And then now what happens when you take a blood pressure? You just do it, right? That's unconscious competence. You have now mastered the skill set, okay? So you have done it so many times that you can do it without thinking. That is the, that is the pinnacle of knowledge. Now that comes with a caveat though. The unconscious competence is where most incidents of failure and mistakes occur. You want a perfect example for that? How many of you think that you can drive with an unconscious competence? You have mastered the ability to drive. You don't have to think about it. Right? Only when you're asleep. Yeah, only when you're asleep. Right? Most of you have mastered driving. Yes? Okay. Except how many accidents have we had in the last year? Why? Because when we are unconscious, we are not conscious in the moment. And when we're not conscious in the moment, we make mistakes. And we make mistakes that can greatly impact people's lives. Okay? It is very important that we are conscious in the moment. So I challenge you to build a knowledge base of unconscious competence, but maintain situational awareness and stay conscious in the moment. I left this slide in here just so you could see what the new hires see. Um, one of the things that we talk about is during the uh, FTEP program, before you come up to your boarding, you're gonna have some time out in the field that is not structured. As you guys sit out at post, we don't tell them what they have to do, right? We say it's, it's your business. However, what I challenge them to do is spend that time studying, building their ability to make decisions, understanding their clinical capacity, knowing their uh, decision-making or their capacity to make decisions. And if they have the discipline in their FTEP process, then they can have the freedom after they pass boarding to do whatever it is they want to do. Versus if they take the freedom to do whatever they do and during the FTEP process, they won't be prepared to pass boarding, and then they'll be back around in the academy recycled. So, presence versus productivity. Is there a difference? I am standing in front of a room full of advanced life-saving providers. Is there a difference between presence and productivity? Yes. yes. Right? So, we all know that, that person who worked somewhere we've worked. And they've been there for years, but we have no clue what it is they do. Right? I know that person. I know that person. Those people are present. You're here, and that's it. We all know those productive providers or those productive coworkers, those productive team members, the people who show up and they constantly produce and try to make things better, right? They continually create value. They continually make our lives better, right? Why do I share this with you? Because if you want to be successful, whether in your personal or professional life, you have to be producing value. You have to be producing something that's going to help you move in the direction that you want to go. There is a caveat with that. Don't mistake productivity or activity for productivity, right? That's the picture here. This guy's working really hard, right? He's active, he's doing something. Most of you know that is work smarter, not harder, right? <clears throat> you know, a good example of that is, is and I'm not, <clears throat> yeah. Keep in mind that the way that you apply yourself in your professional career and your ability to be involved and engaged in the uh, operational capacity in which you choose to maintain will greatly impact where you're gonna be in five, 10, 15 years. 
<clears throat> Another thing that has become very apparent to me as I've moved into the leadership positions that I have is that EMS obviously carries an innate level of stress. Okay, We see things that most people don't see. We go into situations that not a lot of people go into. We have to help people through traumatic and critical incidents. But then we also have the normal everyday stresses that we face as individuals, financial stresses, relationship stresses, um, family stresses, work stresses, being able to provide. We also see safety stresses. Every time we come to work, we're putting our lives at risk. We may put our partner's lives at risk. We may put our coworkers' lives, if you want to say it, um, at risk. And then based off the situation or the scenario, we may see stresses that we haven't seen before. I want you to understand that we cannot wait for the critical stress incident to break us over that point. We have to be taking care of ourselves before that. We have to be taking care of ourselves now. And there's very simple ways you can do that. Things like being active. I don't care what it is you do. You, know, you don't have to be a professional crossfitter or powerlifter. If you want to, more power to you. I encourage it. But you don't have to. Simple things like going for a walk, taking your dogs out, being engaged, go for a hike. I don't care what it is. Go fishing. You have to be able to mitigate that, mitigate that stress. Because if you don't, it will start to weigh on you and it will come out in a manner that you don't want it to. Okay? And what you don't want to do is wait for that critical stress incident to push you over that, uh, over that hill. On the flip side of that, though, you do have good stress. The good stress is the stress you felt before you walked into your boarding scenario this morning or your grand round scenario. Okay? That's stress that challenge you, challenges you to work outside of your comfort zone. Why do we challenge you? Why do we push you outside of your comfort zone? Because if you are comfortable, you have mastered that area. And if you have mastered that area, then you're not growing, right? If you're comfortable, then it means you know how to perform. You know what your limits are. There's a, there's a really cool video of a rabbi talking about how lobsters grow and he talks about how the, um, the cue for the lobster to share, shed off its hard shell is the pain that it feels as it grows. Okay? So the stimulation for growth is adversity. right? So in relation to this good stress, there are two ways that you can approach that. There's a threat-based mindset and a challenge-based mindset. The threat-based mindset is the person who only sees the negative things, the pejorative things, the... the um, the fear of failure, the fear of inadequacy, the fear of not being able to perform to the same standard, judgment, uh, the whole nine yards, right? And then there's the challenge-based mindset, which allows you to see the opportunity in the growth, to see the, uh, the good that is going to come out of what situation or whatever environment that you're in. Again, that drives home the point. There is always opportunity for growth. There is always something good that will come out of whatever challenge it is that you're facing. Now, how do you integrate this into your daily operation? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to lead courageously. You have to be willing to stand up in front of a group of your providers who are continually laughing. Okay? It's not easy for me to stand here in front of you. It's not easy to get heckled. It's not easy to challenge a group of people as a newly appointed supervisor. It's not easy. Okay? But what is my goal? My goal is to improve your lives. My goal is to make your jobs better. My goal is to create a place that you guys enjoy coming to work and you go home feeling fulfilled. And that's not a joke to me. Okay? And in order to do that, I have to reject passivity. Every day I come to work, I have to work hard. And I do, and I challenge you to do so as well, because your peers want you to, just like you want your peers to. I challenge you to accept responsibility, just like I was talking about with the, the mother who brings her child out to you. You all have chosen to maintain a position in which you are required to maintain CEUs and have a level of understanding of pre-hospital care. 
Take that responsibility seriously. And then walk with integrity. Like I said before, I do everything that I challenge you to do, and I do it to the best of my ability. Every morning I wake up, I shine my boots. Every day I come to work, I wear shirt stays so my shirt stays tucked in. If I'm going to challenge you to be better, I'm going to work to be better myself. Okay? And I'm going to leave you with a call to action. Every single one of you possesses the capacity to impact the culture here. Why do I say that? Because you are the culture here. When you're out there running calls, you are the person who stands up and runs the call for somebody else, just like somebody else stands up and runs the call for you. I challenge you to start to take care of your teams and keep that momentum going. We're seeing it now more than we have ever before. Cox Health is quickly becoming a nationally recognized agency. As many of you know, as we began to train the SOCOMs, there are four clinical sites that train special operations combat medics in the United States. Cox Health is the only clinical site that shows a 100% pass rate by the second test. The only clinical site. You guys are the ones doing that. The people who are out in the field, the people who are trying to impact those students. You guys are making that happen. Keep that momentum going. There is absolutely no reason that we cannot continue to grow this as we build our impact, our community outreach, the, the level of, of agencies that we train with are continuing to grow. We are quickly becoming a nationally recognized EMS agency. And you guys are the ones doing that. So continue that momentum. If you see things that aren't working, if you see things that you want to, want to make better, come to me with a solution and I will do everything I can to help you succeed in implementing that solution. <clears throat> My goal, again, is to work together with you to create that environment in which you enjoy coming to work and you go home feeling fulfilled. Not a single one of this, in this room, I would argue, got in this field to be able to make millions of dollars, right? We got into this field because we enjoy what we do, because we're able to impact people's lives, because we can make a difference, right? I challenge you to, to see to what degree you can impact people's lives, to what degree of a level of a provider that you can create. And with that, that is all I have.